हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर अद्वैत एंड वेलकम टू लेक्चर नंबर सिक्स ऑफ सेल द यूनिट ऑफ लाइफ नाउ बिफोर वी बिगिन टूडेज लेक्चर एज ऑलवेज लेट्स हैव अ क्विक रिकैप ऑफ व्हाट वी हैव डन इन द प्रीवियस फाइव लेक्चर्स सो इन लेक्चर नंबर वन वी स्टार्टेड ऑफ टॉकिंग अबाउट वाई आर देर सो मेनी लैटिन वर्ड्स इन आवर सब्जेक्ट कॉल्ड बायोलॉजी I explained to you that biology is the study of life. We saw that botany is the study of plants, zoology is the study of animals. We saw what are autotrophs, we saw what are heterotrophs, and finally in the first lecture we also discussed what is the definition of cell. Cell is defined as the structural and functional unit of life. This was lecture number 1. In lecture number 2 we continued talking about the history of microscopy and we spoke about people like robert hooke and ton von leeuwenhoek and how they pioneered the science of microscopy which opened up this entire world of cell to us we saw what is the definition of cytology so cyton is cell logos is study of so cytology is defined as the microscopic study of cell we also spoke about the cell theory as proposed by schleiden schwann and virchow it states that all living things are made up of cells or they are products it also states that all new cells are going to come from pre existing cells in lecture number 3 we started talking about what is the concept of metabolism so whenever smaller molecules join together to form a bigger molecule we call it as anabolism whenever a bigger molecule gets broken down into smaller molecules we call it as catabolism and these are basically the two main types of chemical reactions that happen inside a living organism together we can call them as metabolism so jodne ko bolte hain anabolism todne ko bolte hain catabolism jodne todne ki ye dono kriyao ko hum bol sakte hain metabolism so i can say that anabolism plus catabolism equals to metabolism we then moved on to what are the parts of a cell in which i discussed that the living material of a cell is called as protoplasm that protoplasm will have a protoplasmic membrane it can have a plasma membrane or a cell membrane inside it it will have the cytoplasm and within the cytoplasm it will have the nucleus also in the case of some cells outside this protoplasm which is living the protoplasm is living outside this you can have a non living structure which protects the protoplasm which is called as the cell wall all cells do not have cell wall so that is what we spoke about in parts of a cell then i explained to you the two hindi anecdotes where we saw what is the basics of genetics or what are the basic things you need to know on which we can build the knowledge of genetics so i told you to remember that there is a cupboard which is going to have books which are going to have pages those pages will have things which are written on it kiske bare mein likha hai kya likha hai so there is cupboard books pages kiske bare mein likha hai kya likha hai you will have nucleus in which you will have chromosomes which are going to be made up of dna and rna which will have genes which will have the various different types of alleles and lastly we saw what are the characters of a cell so cell is a structural and functional unit of life it is going to be made up of a living material called protoplasm surrounded by protoplasmic membrane or plasma membrane within that it is going to be compartmentalized into a controlling center called as the nucleus and an executive center called as the cytoplasm the nucleus contains the genetic material in the form of dna and rna that is responsible for transmission of hereditary characters the cytoplasm contains the various cell organelles that carry out the metabolic activities of a cell a cell is going to be capable of growth and division if the need be it can also repair itself so these were the characteristics of a cell in the third lecture we also discussed about what is a prokaryotic cell and what is a eukaryotic cell so i explained to you that a eukaryotic cell has a true nucleus with a proper nuclear membrane and a prokaryotic cell does not have a proper nuclear membrane in lecture number 4 we actually started talking about the eukaryotic cell and i told you that we would be discussing nucleus during that lecture and that is what we did we discussed the entire nucleus in lecture number 4 so what did we do then we saw that this is an animal cell and in the animal cell we highlighted the nucleus 
and once we did that we understood that the nucleus will have a nuclear envelope and it will have the nuclear matrix so we took a part of the nuclear envelope and we magnified it so we saw that whatever was inside will be called as the nuclear matrix could also be called as a nucleoplasm and the nuclear envelope is going to have these multiple nuclear pores at the same time there will be an outer nuclear membrane and an inner nuclear membrane in between which you will have the perinuclear space which is about 10 to 50 nanometers we saw this is how the nuclear envelope looks on the electron microscope and you can also see this as the outer membrane this as the inner membrane and these various dots that you see here are the nuclear pores if we were to magnify them this is how it would appear like so that was the nuclear envelope then coming to the nuclear matrix we saw that there were two parts to the nuclear matrix there was going to be a dark staining chromatin which was discovered by Fleming and it is also going to have something in the center here called as the nucleolus so the nuclear matrix has something called as chromatin so it is material of the nucleus which is stained by basic dyes and since chromatin is nothing but DNA with proteins I told you that that DNA could be of two types whether it's a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell whether it's a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell both will have DNA which looks like this like this a DNA double helix but the difference being that in the case of a eukaryotic cell it is linear and you can see the ends whereas in the case of a prokaryotic cell the two ends are going to be connected so it will appear to be circular so we saw that eukaryotic cell has linear DNA and prokaryotic cell has circular DNA so with that we finished talking about chromatin and we came to the central structure you see here called as the nucleolus so the nucleolus is seen only in the eukaryotic nucleus it is going to be a roughly spherical body it does not have any membrane it is without a membrane so whatever is the components of the nucleolus they will be continuous with the nucleoplasm nucleolus help in protein synthesis and in cells which are actively doing a lot of protein synthesis there will be multiple nucleoli inside the nucleoplasm so the nucleus has a nuclear envelope and within it it will have the nucleoplasm or the nuclear matrix which will have two components it will have something called as the chromatin and it will have something which is going to be called as the nucleolus finally we saw what is the difference between a eukaryotic nuclei and a prokaryotic nuclei so what did we see here we saw that eukaryotic nucleus is a true organized nucleus whereas here there is no true organized nucleus in a prokaryotic cell they have a dark staining area simply called as the nucleoid a nuclear membrane will be present a nuclear membrane or envelope will be absent nucleoplasm will be separate from the cytoplasm nucleoplasm will be continuous with the cytoplasm in this case you will always have more than one chromosome whereas here you will only have one chromosome here you will have uh, linear DNA here you will have circular DNA nucleolus is going to be present and nucleolus is going to be absent so right here you can see these differences which I just spoke about in lecture number five which was the last lecture we started talking about the living components or the organelles here we first spoke about a few words the first three words which we discussed were inter or meso intra or endo and exo epiperi so these were the first three types of words and as far as inter is concerned it means in between so if you have a look at this cell here so there are two cells and you will notice that this area in between will be called as inter so we can call this area as the intercellular space if we talk about this cell again whatever you find on the inside will be called as intra or endo and whatever is outside can commonly be called as extra exo epi or peri extra or exo simply means outside however epi means outside and above whereas peri means outside and surrounding so these were the first three words which we discussed inter or meso which means in between intra or endo which means inside exo epi peri which means outside but epi can mean outside and above and peri can mean outside and surrounding so then let's continue with this list of words you have phyla which means leaf 
plastos which means something that is specially made or produced amylose which means carbohydrates or starch Eluro, which literally in Greek means wheat flour, gehu ka aata, which is rich in proteins. So eluro means with reference to proteins. Elion in Greek is olive oil or oil related to oil or fats. Thulakos basically means pouches. The cavities inside things can be called as lumen. And lamella or lamina simply means sheets or membranes. So I hope this entire list is clear now with everyone. Then we also discussed the colors in Greek or Latin. So you are going to have erythros, leucos, lutos, chloros, cyanos. So color is chroma, erythro is red, leucos is white, lutos is yellow, chloros is green and cyanos is blue. From this it becomes very clear that erythrocytes would mean red cells chlorophyll would mean green leaf or green things inside leaf so these were all the words which we discussed in the last lecture the greek and latin words which we discussed in the last lecture then we spoke about pigments pigments are chemicals with color and i showed you this beautiful forest with a lake in between i showed it to you from another angle we also saw it from up top where we could see that the leaves could be dark green, they could be light green, they could be yellowish, they could be reddish, they could be orangish, they could be dark red. So from this forest, literally we could collect the leaves and they would look like this. So we took a bunch of leaves and we saw that the green pigment, the green chemical which is giving the green color to the leaves is called as chlorophyll. And the other ones which are ranging here from yellow orange to red are called as carotenoids so there are two types of pigments chlorophyll and carotenoids which you can find inside a plant chlorophyll is fat soluble it is chemically a group called as porphyrins and of course it is green in color carotenoids are also fat soluble they are tetraterpenes and they can range from yellow orange to red Carotenoids are of many types and I gave you two examples of the common carotenoids. You have carotene and you have xanthophyll. The main difference being presence or absence of oxygen. So here carotene contains only hydrogen and carbon C40H56 whereas xanthophyll is C40H56O2. Carotene is more orange whereas xanthophyll is more yellow. So just remember that carotene is more commonly found in carrots which are orange in color so carotene is more orange whereas xanthophyll is going to be more yellow so here in last lecture we saw many greek and latin words we saw the different names of colors in greek or latin and we also saw what are the types of pigments that are found inside or within plants and then we spoke about what are the cell organelles found in a eukaryotic cell so I told you this entire list of organelles like plastids, mitochondria, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, vacuoles and cytoskeleton. In the previous lecture, we had finished off plastids. So plastids are the cell organelles which are found in the case of a plant cell and on the basis of their pigments, they can be classified into three groups which we had discussed. So you have chloroplast, chromoplast and leucoplast. Chloroplast, as the name suggests, contain mostly chlorophyll and some carotenoids. You are going to have chromoplast, which is mostly carotenoids and looks somewhat like this, orangish, reddish in color. Leucoplasts are called leucoplasts because they appear whitish, they have no color, they are colorless. And leucoplasts are basically for storage. So these two were containing pigments and these are going to store chemicals that might be required by the plant cell. So leucoplasts are broadly classified into three groups. You have amyloplast, alioplast and eluroplast. Amyloplast stores starch in the case of potatoes. Elioplast stores oils and fats. And you have eluroplast which are going to store proteins. So this chart tells you or this chart speaks about the classification of plastids as given in the NCRT. Then we started off with chloroplasts. Majority of the chloroplasts of the green plants are found in the mesophyll cells of the leaves and I explained to you that in the case of a cut section of a leaf, this is the epidermis, this is also the epidermis and what you see here are going to be the mesophyll cells 
and all these little green dots which you see here are nothing but the chloroplast inside the cell. There can be anywhere from 20 to 40 chloroplast per cell in the mesophyll. We also saw that the mesophyll might have 20 to 40 chloroplast per cell but there are certain single cell organisms like chlamydomonas which look like this and which only have one single chloroplast. So chloroplast can range from one in chlamydomonas to 20 to 40 in the case of the mesophyll cells of higher plant. Then we said that chloroplasts can either be lens shaped or oval or spherical or discoid or ribbon like organelles and I showed you this diagram of spirogyra which shows that this is a single chloroplast which as you can see is spirally coiled or like a ribbon. Moving on we saw that this is a plant cell and in this plant cell we highlighted the chloroplast and this is the highlighted chloroplast which we enlarged. Here the first thing that we saw was it can be about 5 to 10 microns in length and it can be about 2 to 4 microns in breadth. This number or this size can vary. At the same time we saw it has a outer membrane and a inner membrane. The space between the outer and inner membrane is going to be called as the intermembrane space and this entire area which you see here which you see here is going to be called as the intermembrane space. The intermembrane space is less permeable and whatever is within the intermembrane space is called as the stroma and the stroma contains the chemicals required for carbohydrate production and photosynthesis. So the reaction of photosynthesis takes place within the stroma. We then saw that there are these structures inside the stroma connecting these paths. These structures which are connecting the stuff inside the stroma, these structures, they are called as the stroma lamellae. The stroma lamellae are nothing but flat membranous tubules and because they are flat membranous tubules, they are called as the stroma lamellae. Now, if you were to focus your energy on this diagram here, on this part of the stroma and if we were to magnify it, we will notice that it has these coin like structures and these coin like structures or these pouches are going to be called as thylakoids, thylakos meaning pouch. And these thylakoids are organized flattened membranous sacs. All of these that you see here are thylakoids and thylakoids are the structures which are going to contain the chlorophyll pigment. If you stack thylakoids one on top of the other, you get something which is going to be called as a granum. So here inside the dotted lines, you can see this structure here is one such granum. This is another one in which the thylakoids have been cut. This is another one. And all of these together can be called as grana. So granum is singular, whereas grana is plural. Inside each of these thylakoids, you can also see the space here and the space is going to be called as lumen. So I can say that there is a outer membrane within which there is the inner membrane and in between the two, there is the intermembrane space. Whatever is present inside the inner membrane is going to be called as the matrix or the stroma. And inside that you have these structures which are called as granum. They are made up of individual coin like structures, pouches which are stacked on top of the other. Each pouch is called as a thylakoid and within the thylakoid you are going to have the chlorophyll. Clear? So now this will become even more clear as we had done it last time that the stromal lamellae, the flat membranous tubules are actually connecting the various thylakoids or the various grana to each other. All right. How does this look inside the electron microscope? We saw that this is how it looks inside the electron microscope. So if you were to take the chloroplast, the illustration, you can compare it here to how it looks inside the electron microscope. All of these structures here are thylakoids stacked on top of each other. So this is a granum. This is a granum. All these dark structures which you see are grana and they are connected by these things which are going to be called as the stromal lamellae or the stroma lamellae. So that, dear students, finishes everything that we need to know about plastids. And now, dear students, we can start off with today's lecture. I know that this was a long recap, but it was necessary because I want everybody to have a crystal clear idea of everything that we've done before so that today we can start off with 
mitochondrion. Now mitochondrion is singular and mitochondria is plural. I am sure everybody since school has learned this. That mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Why is it called as the powerhouse of the cell? Because as we saw in the first lecture, this reaction is called as photosynthesis. And this second reaction in which glucose gets combined with oxygen to give you carbon dioxide, water and ATP. This second reaction that we had seen earlier is called as respiration. Because this reaction happens in the mitochondria, we say that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So this reaction happens in the chloroplast or the plastid, whereas this reaction happens in the mitochondria and hence mitochondria is called as the powerhouse of the cell. Before we begin with the mitochondria, today I quickly want to talk about cubes. I am sure you are wondering ke, why am I teaching you geometry right now, but before we proceed with mitochondria, it is essential that we talk a little bit about geometry. All right. So what I have here is a simple model of a cube. As far as a cube is concerned, it is going to have six sides. It will have a floor, it will have a roof and it will have four sides as you can see here. So this is a simple cube with six sides, a floor and a roof. Since it's a cube, each of its side is a square and the surface area of that is going to be length into breadth. So you simply take this surface area and multiply it by six and that is the surface area of this entire cube. This cube also has volume. What is the volume of this cube? The amount of space which is there inside the cube can be called as its volume, whatever space is there inside. So the volume can be calculated as its length, breadth into its depth. So LBH, length, breadth, height, length, breadth, height, that can be calculated as its volume. So that is the amount of space that is present inside. Now, I am going to take one more cube, which is going to be of the same volume, approximately of the same volume. So you can see here that these two are going to be approximately of the same volume. Can everybody see that? Can everybody agree with that? That this and this approximately seem to have the same volume. Now, in this cube, the second one which I have taken, this is its upper surface. So this is one of its surfaces. Can you see that? Right. Now what I am going to do is, I am literally going to take a surface which is double the area of this. So have a look at this. So can you see that this surface is clearly twice of this. So this has twice the surface area. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to fold it. Please remember that this and this have the same surface area, have the same surface area because this is just folded. It's just folded. Can you see that? So if I unfold this, it will be just as big. It will be just as big. So I have just folded this. So this is what we get. And now I'm going to take this and I'm going to place it on our second cube. So this cube now has this surface with this foldings. Now why am I doing all this right now? Have a look at our original cube. Both of them still have more or less the same volume. But there is one big difference now. This cube has more surface area than this cube. Because how many sides does this have? Six. So when we were calculating that, it had six sides. And we calculated that its surface area would be six times the length and the breadth for this one. But in this, the volume is remaining more or less the same. Andar kitni jaga hai, yahan pe kitni jaga ye rok hai. What is the volume is the same. But this surface is no longer X. It is no longer this much, this much. Can you see that this 
is almost double the surface area of this. So if I compare this cube with this cube, if I compare the two, this surface area and this surface area, if this is x, this is literally 2 times x. Has everybody understood this? The reason why I am taking the effort to show this to you is so that now it should be crystal clear to you that if these are cells, the cell which has foldings will have more surface area for the same volume. Iska or iska volume, almost same. But kiska surface area zada hai? Iska. Because foldings kya hai? Has everybody clearly understood this? So, the reason why I showed you these models right now is so that you understand that folding increases surface area for a given volume. Folding increases surface area for a given volume. Of course, if you increase the volume, surface area will increase. If this cube, if I was to make it bigger, of course, the surface area will increase. So, bada kia volume to surface area bad nahi wala hai. But if you are going to keep the same volume by folding, you can increase the surface area. So, in the volume same tha, but ye just my folding tha, uska surface area zyada hoga. So, folding increases surface area for a given volume. Now, why is this so important? Why would you want to increase surface area for a given volume? There are three reasons, three very important reasons. So, have a look at the side. Here I have demarcated two spaces or two volumes. You can see that the upper blue part and the lower blue part are almost having the same volume. They are occupying the same space. Ab is jaga pe, upar bhi mene char cells rakhe aur niche bhi char cells rakhe. So you can see that the volume of the green cells on the top and the volume of the green cells down is more or less the same. The difference is that niche wale cells mein, I have given it foldings. There are foldings. Can you see that? So, upar wala is occupying the same area as niche wala. Jo blue jaga thi, wo dono hi cells occupy kar rahe. But niche wale cells utni jaga mein, upper surface pe they are showing foldings. So, what is the advantage of this? The advantage is that if the upper cells are absorbing something from this surface, if they are absorbing something from this surface, can you see here? If they are absorbing something from this surface, like this. So, ye niche wale bhi absorb karenge, but they will be able to absorb more because the surface area is more. For a given volume, the surface area is now more. So, niche wale cells are able to absorb more. So, folding increases absorption. So, if it increases absorption, the contrary or the opposite thing should also be true. As in, if you take the same diagram and instead of the arrows going inwards, let us say that the cells are not absorbing, they are secreting something. So in this case, this is how they are secreting. So this is how it will happen. Now compare the same secretion to the lower model. This is how it will happen. So the lower one, not only can it absorb more because it has more surface area, agar wo apne andar kuch bana ke bahar fek rahe, it will be able to do that also more effectively. So the second reason why you are folding is because it increases secretion. And finally, the third reason is, again, have a look at the two sets of cells. If I was to take a ball and stick it on the cell, on the upper surface of the cell, and if I was to continue doing that, this is how it would look like. These are a total of 19 red balls, which we have stuck to the surface. If I was to take the same sized ball, and if I was to put them on the surface below, this is how it would look like. There is no need for you to count. I have already counted. There are 35 red balls. So just by folding the upper surface of the cells shown below, we were able to attach almost double the amount of red balls. So here you can see that there are 19 and in the same volume we are able to stick almost 35. 
double of that in the upper model. So the third reason why we have folding which increases surface area is to increase attachment. So dear students, this is one of the most important basic concepts in biology that folding increases surface area for a given volume. Why would you want to increase the surface area for a given volume? Because you want to either increase absorption or increase secretion or increase attachment. So henceforth, for the next two years, if I was to ever ask you, ke idhar ye diagram mein kya dikh raha hai? If I was to show you any diagram, and if that diagram has any folding of any kind, if there is a folding, turant tumhare dimag ka ghanti bajna chahiye ke there is only one reason why this folding has happened. You want to increase the surface area in a given volume. So in any biological diagram, the minute you see foldings, there is only one reason. You want to increase the surface area in a given volume. Now, why would you want to increase the surface area? As you can see here, there are three reasons. Number one, you are going to increase the absorption at that area. Number two, you are going to increase the secretion. And number three, you are going to increase the attachment of something. So before we can start talking about the mitochondria, these points were important and within the next 10 to 15 minutes you will understand why we did this right now okay so with all of this out of the way let's start talking about the mitochondrion so mitochondrion is singular and mitochondria is plural this is a animal cell as we have been seeing before and i have highlighted the mitochondria in the animal cell and we are going to magnify it and this is how it would look as in the illustrated form. The mitochondria is going to have a length of about 1 to 4.1 microns whereas it will have a thickness of about 0.2 to 1 microns. Usually it is about 0.5. So this is the dimension of the mitochondria around 1 to 4.1 microns in length and about 0.2 to 1 micron in its thickness mostly or diameter mostly about 0.5 microns unless specifically stained they are not easily visible under the compound microscope now why is this point important so the first reason is chloroplast can be easily seen in the microscope even if you don't add any special colors simply because they have the green pigment chlorophyll so in the microscope, you can see the green colored things. Mitochondria do not have any such pigments. So they have to be specifically stained. You have to put colors which will be absorbed by the mitochondria so that you can see them. Another reason why mitochondria are not easily seen is because of their size. So here is the size of the chloroplast which we have seen before. It is about 5 to 10 microns in its length and about 2 to 4 microns in its diameter can be bigger also but this is the average size if this is the size of the chloroplast this is how the mitochondria would compare to it so notice that this is 5 to 10 whereas this is 1 to 4 length this is 2 to 4 whereas this is 0.2 to 1 usually around half a micron so mitochondria are difficult to see because they are small in size and the other issue is that they do not have any pigment of their own. So they have to be specifically or specially stained. Clear? Okay. So mitochondria 1 to 4.1 micrometers or microns in length and 0.2 to 1 micrometer in diameter, mostly around 0.5. The number of mitochondria in a cell is variable depending on the activity of the cell. So if the cell is very active and doing a lot of things, it requires a lot of ATP. So, of course, the mitochondria powerhouse of the cell will be multiple. So, the number will be depending on the physiological activity of the cell. At the same time, in terms of shape and size also, there is a considerable number of variation. So, they say that the shape of the mitochondria is usually sausage shape or it is going to be cylindrical. Now, those of you who don't know, sausage is basically something that looks like this as you can see here so sausage is basically a cylinder which is made up of meat 
so it's a cylindrical meat filled cylinder and this can be various meats like they can be pork they can be chicken meat so there are a lot of meats with which you can make this and most commonly it is eaten in this form this structure that you see here is a hot dog so hot dog basically is a bun or a bread in which they put the sausage they put some spices and some sauces and you can eat this so this is what is a sausage so as you must have now clearly understood if this is how sausages look like this is how the mitochondria looks like this is how the mitochondria looks like and hence they say that mitochondria is sausage like or cylindrical clear okay moving on the mitochondria has a outer membrane and a inner membrane just like the chloroplast so the chloroplast also had an outer membrane and an inner membrane and inside the inner membrane whatever was present in the chloroplast was called stroma or matrix the same thing is also applicable here you have a outer membrane and a inner membrane and whatever is inside the inner membrane even here is called as the matrix in between the two the outer membrane and the inner membrane whatever is present here is called as the outer compartment so in the chloroplast we said that here there was an intermembrane space this this was the intermembrane space in the case of a mitochondria we do not call it as the intermembrane space we call it as the outer compartment which means that obviously this area here will be called as the inner compartment so there is a outer membrane inner membrane outer or inner ke beech mein outer compartment or inner membrane ke andar you are going to have the inner compartment so inner membrane ke andar you have the inner compartment the inner compartment is filled with a dense homogeneous material which is called as the matrix so like i said chloroplast also has matrix and mitochondria also has matrix in the chloroplast we can also call that as the stroma now here the outer compartment this part here the outer compartment the outer compartment as well as the inner compartment both of them are going to be aqueous so they are going to be filled with a homogeneous watery material so the outer compartment and inner compartment both are aqueous okay the outer membrane is the continuous limiting boundary so in the case of a mitochondria the outer membrane is the limiting boundary within which the mitochondria is held matlab bahar ka jo continuous boundary hai now they are calling it as continuous continuous because if you see the inner membrane have a look at the inner membrane the inner membrane has these numerous foldings so you can see that the outer membrane here 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 this whole outer membrane is extremely smooth and continuous but the inner membrane the inner membrane is not smooth and continuous is not smooth and continuous you can see that there are numerous infoldings here can you see that can you see this so the outer membrane is continuous limiting boundary whereas the inner membrane shows infoldings and these are called cristae so one is called crista many are called cristae so these infoldings are called cristae now let's see how many of you are really awake these are infoldings infoldings are foldings why will you have foldings to increase surface area in a given volume which means ke mitochondria apne andar try kar raha hai ke folding 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 karo so agar folding nahi hota aur andar ka membrane bhi continuous hota to there will be less surface area but the minute you fold the inner membrane there is more surface area so if you have a mitochondria of this size if the inner membrane is continuous it will have x surface area but if the inner membrane is going to be having multiple foldings it can even have 10x surface area so same volume same jagah ke andar kya bada sakte hain surface area kaise bada sakte hain by foldings is this now very clear to everybody okay so why do you have foldings only one reason to increase surface area why do you want to increase surface area one of three possible answers which are those three possible answers either you want to increase absorption or you want to increase secretion or you want to increase attachment idhar kya ho raha hai 
I will discuss in five minutes. But now immediately you must realize that either kuch to ho raha hai, ya to increase absorption karne ka hai, increase secretion karne ka hai, ya to increase attachment karne ka hai. Clear? So we will see that in the next five minutes. Okay. As far as this mitochondria is concerned, this is the reaction that is going to take place. This whole reaction. And what is this whole reaction going to be called? Correct. It's going to be called as respiration. And that is what we saw in the beginning of this discussion. That mitochondria are the sites for aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration meaning using oxygen. Breakdown of carbohydrates using oxygen. So they are the sites for aerobic respiration. And that is why mitochondria are rightly called as the powerhouse of the cell. Now, to do this reaction, to do this reaction, you are going to require enzymes. What will you require? Enzymes. So now, my question is, what are enzymes? I'm going to pause for five seconds so that you can think about this. What are enzymes? I think majority of you would have said something like they are biocatalyst or they are catalyst. So my next question to you is what are catalysts? So again many of you would have mumbled this very quickly right now. Catalysts are those compounds which can increase the rate of reaction without taking part in the reaction blah 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 blah. So then I want to ask you, what would be the difference between a catalyst and a biological catalyst? So if you are unsure of that, let me explain this to you. If we were to take ice, so let's say I take a small piece of ice and I place it on the table. After some time, this ice will convert to water. And if you don't do anything to this water, this water will slowly, slowly convert into vapor. It will begin to dry off and it will evaporate. So this everybody knows that there will be a change in state from solid to liquid to gas, ice to water to vapor. Now, if this ice, which we are considering in this example, if I was to put a small candle next to it. So I hope everybody understood what the triangle stands for. So if I was to put a small candle next to it, what will happen to the conversion from ice to water? Correct, it will happen faster. You're right. Similarly, if I was to boil the water that was there, what would happen? It would convert to vapor faster. So in this highly simplified example, I can say that this is a chemical reaction in which heat is acting as a chemical catalyst. So what you see here is a simple chemical reaction in which heat is acting as the chemical catalyst. Let's take one more example. Carbon dioxide, when it combines with water, what do you get? Now, I don't know what most of you are thinking, but you will get carbonic acid. So this also is a very simple chemical reaction. Wherever you have water, the atmosphere is going to have carbon dioxide. Some amount of carbon dioxide will mix with the water and you will get carbonic acid. So you can take lots of carbon dioxide, put it into water and make lots of carbonic acid. But even if you are just randomly placing a glass of water, some amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide will dissolve in it. So I hope you know that this is a very simple, straightforward chemical reaction where carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid. But you also must be knowing this because I have been going on about this since the very first lecture that both these compounds can also make glucose and oxygen which requires sunlight and chlorophyll. This reaction as we've been going on is as I have been going on telling you continuously is called photosynthesis happens in the chloroplast. We did all of this in the last lecture. Now why am I showing this to you again? Let's say that I was to take a small katori, a small bowl and I was to put water inside it. I was to take a leaf from a plant and I was to crush it and put inside this and I was to place this in my terrace or in my balcony in direct sunlight. So the katori has water 
the atmosphere has carbon dioxide which mixes with the water so we have these two components i have put some leaves inside it so it also has chlorophyll some crushed leaves so it will have some chlorophyll and i'm putting it in direct sunlight now my question to you is glucose shakkar banega ki nahi banega think about this banega ke nahi banega the answer is of course nahi banega because agar ye banega to dukan se koi shakkar hi nahi kharidega na your mom will simply take a bucket full of water put some leaves in it and simply put the bucket on the terrace char panch din ke baad directly ja ke balti bhar shakkar milega so i think that it should be clear to you that this reaction does not happen in the katori it does not happen in the bucket which means that this reaction will only happen if all these things are there if all these things are there inside a living plant so it's extremely important that the plant is living otherwise this reaction is not going to happen and that is why this reaction this reaction photosynthesis is different from this reaction which is given above of ice converting to water converting to ice this lower reaction is a biological reaction it's a biological reaction and hence i can say that chlorophyll is a biological catalyst chlorophyll is a biological catalyst so how does all this matter if i was to take this and if i was to remove the candle will ice convert to water yes but it will just take a little longer if i just let the water be there and not disturb it one hour two hours 10 hours one day two days 10 days eventually it will convert to vapor but in this reaction if i was to remove the sunlight or rather if i was to remove the chlorophyll if i was to remove the living plant from this reaction this reaction will not happen hoga hi nahi in fact ye jo idhar maine chokdi mari hai ki ye reaction nahi hoga ye chokdi aisa ho jayega vinash nahi sarvanash hoga there will be no destruction there will be annihilation for those of you who did not understand this if i was to simply remove chlorophyll or living plants with chlorophyll from our planet this reaction will not happen which i just explained to you 5 minutes back if this reaction doesn't happen there is no glucose how do we make atp how do we make atp by using glucose in the very first lecture i told you that we cannot make glucose we rely on plants so if chlorophyll gaya living plants gaya to glucose gaya aur agar glucose gaya to sab log gaya this dear children is the significance of a biological catalyst you remove a chemical catalyst from a chemical reaction the reaction will happen it will only happen slowly but if you remove the biological catalyst from the biological reaction the reaction will not happen at all biological catalysts are called enzymes enzymes are defined as biological catalysts they are catalysts for biological reactions so they are called biocatalysts how do biocatalysts differ from chemical catalyst or simply catalysts no enzymes no reaction all biological reactions require enzymes all biological reactions require enzymes so whether it is photosynthesis or it is respiration or it is any kind of anabolic or catabolic reaction it is something happening inside a living organism it will require biocatalyst it will require enzymes why is all this important right now in today's discussion because we saw that to do this reaction inside the mitochondria inside the powerhouses of the cell you require enzymes 
and that brings us to cristae which are infoldings which increase the surface area why do you want to increase the surface area three reasons could be one of three reasons and what is the reason here in the mitochondria why do you want to increase the surface area for attachment of respiratory enzymes so if you have more surface area inside the mitochondria you can chip cow more amount of the enzymes here more enzymes more reaction so if you have more respiratory enzymes here you will be able to do more of this reaction you will be able to generate more atp you will be able to do your function function of the mitochondria production of atp more efficiently in fact there are two membranes here there is the outer membrane and the inner membrane there is a the outer membrane and the inner membrane and both these membranes have their own specific enzymes which are associated with mitochondrial function what is the main mitochondrial function production of atp so the inner membrane will have lots and lots of lo enzymes simply because it has foldings increasing surface area to which you can attach those enzymes so i hope everybody now is clear with the concept of why foldings are important and what are enzymes and how this all fits into our discussion of the mitochondria okay so lastly how does it look in the electron microscope this is how it looks so if we were to see the illustration and compare it to the electron microscope you can see how we were able to make this illustration from this diagram so you can see that this here is the outer membrane this is the inner membrane and these are the infoldings which are going to be called as cristae so that dear children finishes off mitochondria so if you see this long list here of all the various cell organelles in a eukaryotic cell we have already finished plastids in the previous lecture and today we spoke about everything related to the mitochondria that dear students concludes today's lecture i hope you have understood everything we have done today and i cannot wait to see your smiling faces in the next lecture thank you god bless work hard be nice